I shall move on to our, our next speaker, who's uh, Jade Blue. Uh, she's uh, currently doing her PhD in her final year, I believe, at Edinburgh University, and has a, has a, a great interest in applied molecular biology and plants. So without further ado, uh, Jade, over to you. Thanks very much. Um, you're welcome. So, um, unfortunately, I don't think my presentation will have as um, my photos as Dan's did, but um, I'm going to talk a bit about um, why it's important to understand how plants cope with environmental stress and also how I study this during my PhD. So, um, we're having, or oh, we have a growing population on the planet, so in, um, inevitably we have to feed everybody. So um, the projection is by 2050, we're gonna have to increase obviously the number of daily calories that we produce for people. And the majority of this will be um, provided by um, vegetable crops like cereals, roots, pulses, um, and vegetable oils, etc. But um, part of the problem with this is that we are limited in the amount of um, land use we can use for food production. So already 50% of the world's habitable land is used for agriculture. And despite 80% of this coming from, of the world's global calorie supply coming from plant-based foods, only 20, about 20% 20 of the agricultural land used is for crops. So the idea is really how do we feed a growing population of by um, 2050 is projected to be 10 billion people without increasing the land we use but also while being more um, conscious of our environment and um, growing these plants in a more um, environmentally friendly way and a more sustainable way so the ways we can do this is by improving the feeds we feed our um, livestock also switching to more plant-based diets but also by producing more resilient crop breeds so what do we mean by what do plants need to be resilient to? So plants have to cope with a range of different environmental stresses. And these can be biotic stresses such as insect, insect pests and diseases like bacterial fungal diseases, or they can be abiotic stresses such as flooding, drought, light stress, and um, nutrient deficient soils due to like, soil erosion from years of using fertilizers. And it is quite a pressing problem because I think it's between 20 and 40 percent of the of crop loss now is caused by diseases and pests, and in like the total combination of abiotic stresses results in around 50 percent of crop loss. So it is quite a pressing issue and something that we need to deal with soon. And um, so the way I study this is I use a model organism. It's called Arabidopsis thapiana. So it was um, had its genome sequenced in it was published in 2000, started in the late 90s. And so it's a really good tool to do molecular biology with to understand how we could apply this to crops in the future. So what I work on is quite a generic response and it's called um, the oxidative burst. And what this is, is it's an accumulation of reactive oxygen species such as like hydrogen peroxide or superoxide, things that oxidants that in humans are known to cause cancer. So we know that they are bad and in plants they are equally as bad as well. And these accumulate in response to many biological processes, simply just plants growing, it's photosynthesis, but as well as stresses. And the levels in the cell, in plant cells are usually very, very tightly controlled because if these are unregulated, then what happens is, is you get, oh, I might change this to the same pointer, um, you get these cell death lesions, which if this takes over the plant can be very damaging, particularly if you do have this in crops, especially um, like leafy vegetable crops, because this becomes unviable for farmers. Um, so, oh, sorry. So this is like on a more on a bigger scale. But what I look at is this on a molecular level. So I won't go into loads and loads of detail. But basically, what happens is you have a type of reactive oxygen species, and what this can do is um, attach itself to proteins, and we call these post-translational modifications. So you can attach itself to proteins, and these proteins may be involved in regulating stress response, and it could be very important. But what happens is, is these become oxidized, particularly on um, the cysteine amino acid, which is quite reactive. And um, so yeah, these become oxidized, and what can happen is it can change where these proteins are found in plant cells, the shape they form, their function, and how active they are. So it can be quite a damaging and detrimental modification if this negatively impacts 
um, important proteins involved in stress. But what's interesting about these modifications is that they are reversible. So what you now have is rather than saying, oh, this is just very bad for the plant, we don't know what to do, you have a molecular switch. So you can essentially control stress signaling through these modifications. So what the, the lab I work in, what my PhD is largely focused on is what causes the reversibility and how can we utilize this? So the reversibility is largely attributed to a family of proteins called thyroidoxin. So what are thyroidoxins? They are a group of enzymes and interestingly in plants, so in Arabidopsis, there are over 20 that have been characterized, whereas compared to humans and other organisms like yeast, they have maybe like between two and four. So it has grown quite a lot in plant species and they are localized throughout the cell, in, for example, in the chloroplast, in the nucleus, in the cytoplasm, or also in the plasma membrane. So what this suggests is that these may play specific roles in biological processes in the plants, and they may also be involved in stress responses. So what we want to know is, do thyroidopsins have specific roles in regulating stress responses? And if so, how? So the idea behind this is that you'd have different stresses and these can produce different kinds of reactive oxygen species or the same kind but for the purposes of this schematic it's, they're different and they have dip, they may have different targets so we want to know if the thyroidopsins involved in regulating these um, are specific for example in the case of stress one or if they overlap between different stresses so how do i do this so the pathways themselves are not important in the presentation but it's just to highlight that how I study this is I use two different mutants that we have which lack the machinery to um, control the levels of reactive oxygen species in plant cells so it but just in two different ways so they for example the catalase mutant which we call cat2 it's an important enzyme directly scavenging um, the reactive oxygen species hydrogen peroxide in the cells so if it lacks this then you get an accumulation and you get those cell death responses as i showed before and then we have pad2 um which is important for maintaining like homeostasis in the cell so the pathways themselves are not important it's just in the next few slides i'll refer to these so i thought i'd explain what they did um so how do we study this in the lab so we do like but we start i guess we start out like surveying them with quite simple experiments so one of the things we can do is we can induce um, the reactive oxygen species in the cell, so the ROS first or oxidative first in the cell, by um, infect or infiltrating plants with a chemical known as methylviologin, which also people might know it as the herbicide paraquat. So what happens is if you infiltrate these plants, if the plants are just regular, like wild type plants that you just find outside, they have the machinery to regulate their levels of reactive oxygen species. So this, in this case, is after 24 hours. You don't see any effect on the plant, really. Whereas if they lack the machinery and they're one of these redox sensitive mutants, then after 24 hours, they die. So it's, it is quite um, an interesting experiment. But what we can do is we can quantify this and simply by treating plants with this chemical and floating leaf discs on water, and then you measure this, how the cells are essentially dying by the ions and electrolytes that are leaking into water. So what, was quite, what we found, which was quite interesting, is that after infiltrating these plants with this chemical, you see in the wild type plants, the WT plants, you see an increase in cell death. Um, but in the reactive, or in our redox mutants, you see that this is higher in compared to wild type plants. And in the case of this mutant, PAD2, you don't see, um, you see that it has a similar level to the um, redox mutant. So it might not be involved in regulating any responses in this plant. But interestingly, in the other mutant we have, the catalase mutant, again, you see an increase in cell death compared to wild type plants, but this is brought down to, or to similar levels as wild type plants. So it suggests that thyroidoxins may be playing, or I didn't really mention yet, this is um, a thyroidoxin family member called nucleoridoxin, which is found in the nucleus and the chloroplast. 
But um, yeah, so it suggests that thyrodopsins and the thyrodopsin family may play specific roles in these responses. And interestingly, infiltrating these plants with this chemical is similar to plants experience light stress. So when you put plants in a high, high light stressful situation, the wild type plants we have just grow as normal, whereas the catalase mutants are, um, they show these cell death lesions here, which is not ideal. And when you put this thyroidopsin member into the plant, these have a few cell death lesions, but they're much healthier and look similar to our wild type plants. And we just measure these. Um, we can look at what we call oxidative stress markers. So genes that we know are upregulated or involved in the stress response. And then you can see in some more than others that you see this um, increase in expression in our redox mutants because they are more stressed. And then these are rescued to different levels in the, our overexpression line. So it suggests that thyroidopsins do play a role in regulating stress responses. And in the case of NRX1, we think it's to do with abiotic stresses such as light stress. But what about biotic stresses such as diseases? So we do this with a simple experiment and it's, um, we infect plants with this another model organism. It's a bacteria called Pseudomonas swingate. And it is quite an agriculturally important um, pathogen because it causes lots of um, bacterial spot on different kinds of brassica plants. And what we do is we can infect plants and then you literally just take, extract the bacteria from the leaves by grinding them up. And you can plate this on petri dishes and count the number of col bacterial colonies that form, so the colony forming units. So with our um, redox mutants, what happens is you have an increase in susceptibility of the plants. So they are more susceptible, so more bacteria grow on the plates compared to wild type plants. Um, interestingly, what we found is if you have a thyroidopsin, in this case thyroidopsin H1, in one of our mutants, this makes no difference when you put this into the plant. However, in our second mutant, what happens is you get a rescue of um, the immune response, and this is brought back down to similar levels as the wild type plant. And so this is with one thyroidopsin, and what we found, which was quite cool, is that if you have a different one, which is a member of the same family, you see the opposite response. So in the catalase mutant, in this case, you do see a rescue, whereas in the PAD2 mutant, you don't. So it gives an idea that thyrodoxins have different roles in different signaling pathways in different stress responses. So we could eventually maybe use this, potentially but in a biotechnological aspect, to understand what this is doing in crops and how we could um, apply it. So, yeah, I think I went through that quite fast, but I guess we're running over, so that's not too bad. But, um, but yeah, so the idea of this really and my PhD is that thyroidopsins may have selective roles in regulating plant responses to environmental stresses. So we could eventually, hopefully, um, apply this in crops to generate more resilient crops to, a, a, to biotic or oh, different kinds of stresses, particularly as these become... Um, yeah, more important due to, like, for example, climate change and how plants have to adapt to these changing environments that they are in. So yeah, so I would like to thank my lab, who I work with um, at the University of Edinburgh, and my funders, which are East Bio. So they fund, it's a collaborative um, funding project between um, Edinburgh, Dundee, St Andrews and Aberdeen. So yeah, thank you very much. Great.